Uh, Tommy Thayer, welcome to Australian Musician. How's it going? Good. Where about some world are you today? I am at uh, northern Oregon coast called Cannon Beach. It's a, a small little beach town up here in Oregon where I have a second home and uh, I like to enjoy my time off here because it's very kickback and it's away from everybody and, and there's not many people around. So I just uh, come up here to unwind and decompress after, you know, touring. We just got back from Europe, a great European leg that lasted a couple of months. Um, and we just got back about a week ago and it was, you know, it was a great, the, the shows were over the top, but it's a long time to be away from home. So uh, we're all enjoying a little bit of time off right now before we head out to Australia here in a couple of weeks. Yeah, we're all, all excited and uh, ready for you here. Um, the End of the Road Tour uh, has had some significant uh, challenges due to the pandemic. Um, how was the vibe within the band when the pandemic was at its peak? Did you think maybe you weren't going to get to all those dates? Well, it was frustrating. You know, we started the End of the Road World Tour uh, in January 2019, and then COVID started towards the beginning of 2020, as we all know, and it you know, we had a great first year of, uh, you know, really successful shows and then everything shut down and we didn't, you know, nobody knew how long this was going to last. You know, it was funny at first we were like, oh, you know, we're going to lock down for a couple of weeks. And we're like, a couple of weeks, how can we live for a couple of weeks without, uh, you know, doing anything? But then it turns out to be a year, year and a half, almost two years. And, you know, we were all uh, disappointed because we were all geared up. We had the, the the tour was up and running. Everything was was going well. And then all of a sudden you kind of get shut down. So it's tough. But I mean, everybody else in the world's had to deal with their own problems with associated with it as well. So we're not alone on that. But it was frustrating. But we just kind of hung together and we got ready. And when the time was right, we put it back together and, and got right back in stride. Yeah. Uh, your first uh, official gig with Kiss, of course, was in Melbourne, Australia, with the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra. Is there a touch of yeah. sentimentality connected to uh, the return for the end of the road? Well, well, no doubt about it, yeah. My first official show as the lead guitarist of KISS was in Melbourne at the uh, at the Telstra Dome, as it was referred to at the time. And, and it was a huge gig. And, uh, you know, it was an, an amazing coming out for me because it was, of course, with the, with the Melbourne Symphony, Symphony and it was being recorded for a live album and a, and a DVD and a documentary. So it was... Uh, you know, a lot was going on and I, I felt a little bit of pressure, I have to admit at the time, because that was the first one and, you know, a lot of eyes on me for sure. So, but, you know, looking back, a lot of fond memories and, you know, it really went amazingly well and, and uh, was a real success. So I was happy about it. But at the time, I have to admit, I was a little traumatized. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Your first uh, actual gig with KISS was a private function. I believe that was a little bit different. Yeah, it was. Um, about nine, 10 months before that, uh, the Kiss Symphony show, we did, uh, my first show was really, I was just kind of filling in. I wasn't really in the band at the time. It was a transitional time, of course, as you know, they were having problems uh, with the lineup at the time. This was in 2002, early 2002. And uh, it just, I got a call from Doc McGee, the, the band's manager. He said, Tommy, uh, we're going down to Jamaica to do this private show uh, and we need you to, go down and play guitar essentially and, and put the makeup on and do this. And I was like, wow. I mean, very exciting, but at the same time, a little uh, nerve wracking because gosh, stepping into big shoes again and putting kiss makeup on and getting ready and, and actually performing on stage, uh, you know, in kiss, that was a, a, a big move at the time. So, but it was a small private show. Uh, it was interesting. It was only a couple hundred people, but it was a full production, full stage full pyro and everything like that. But it was, uh, we have some video and, and I think when we get around to doing Kissology 4, there'll be footage uh, from that night on Kissology 4. And it's really interesting to watch now because again, it was, I mean, a whole new thing for me and, and uh, it was very exciting, but kind of uh, nerve wracking at the same time. Yeah. Um, at, at one point you were the, uh, the tour manager for Kiss too. How was that experience? Yeah. Well, I've, I've, I'm a jack of all trades. I've done just about, a little bit of everything with Kiss through the years. I've definitely have the most unique perspective uh, with Kiss and doing all these different things and, and and different jobs and things like that. I mean, as you know, back in the '80s, I had Black and Blue, my band, and we 
uh, put records out. And actually, Gene Simmons uh, produced a couple of the records, as most people know. And, and we toured with Kiss in 1985 as an opening act. And that's really when I got to know them to begin with. And, um, you know, Gene got involved. And then after that, he asked me to to write with them for Kiss. They were working on Hot in the Shade and they needed some uh, some song input. So I wrote a couple tunes with him and just got more involved in it and it progressed. But then Black and Blue ran its course and um, eventually the band ended. So I was kind of between things and they asked me to come work for them part time to begin with just in the organization, behind, you know, doing whatever needed to be done. So I got involved and that was in the early 90s. And then it all kept continued to evolve over time. I started working on videos and ended up tour managing and, and all kinds of things. And uh, so I've, I've seen it from all angles, no doubt about it. Yeah. Well, fast forward to 2022 and you are coming to Australia with this show. Um, tell me about the set list. Does that change at all from night to night or is there too much technology connected to song? Yeah. I got to be honest, it doesn't change very much. Uh, and I know there's a lot of fans that say, why can't you change the set list around more often? And and I think you hit it on the head. People have to understand that with all the technology and all the, you know, the 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 the, the show and the, the pyro, all the cues and the, the gags and everything we do, it's not easy to change songs around because everything, you know, including video production, you know, it's all kind of locked into to those particular songs. So once we start a tour, it's hard to just, you know, we're not Bruce Springsteen where we can play a different set, you know, every night and, and it's no problem because we're just up there strumming guitars. I mean, it's very involved, you know, very choreographed what we do. So uh, we're not the band that can switch songs around tour in the middle of a tour very easy. And uh, there's reasons for that, of course. Uh, sure. But we like to play different things sometimes. I mean, when we do the Kiss Cruise, <laughs> Uh, we will mix the songs up and start playing deeper cuts and doing all kinds of th things like that. But normally it's hard to, to change the songs around. You've got a, a few uh, uh, signature guitars with Gibson and Epiphone. Uh, how, yes. many, how many of those do you take on tour? Well, I take a, a lot of them. I play the, uh, the signature guitars, which are done by Epiphone. I've had four different signature guitars now and uh, they've done really well. I sell a lot of them. And, and, you know, to be honest with you, a lot of, fans actually buy them and just collect them or I sign them and, and do things like that. So um, I've, I've, I've been real happy with the Epiphone signature guitars. I've done four of them, like I said, and the most current one's called the Electric Blue Les Paul. And uh, I'll play them on stage. Uh, you know, then I have my regular touring Gibson guitars that are very similar as well. Uh, you know, the Electric Blue Les Paul. I've, my, my main stage guitar that I probably played most over the last four or five years is the White Lightning Les Paul, as you know, and, and that gets the most stage time. And I've got a few other things, but it's pretty, uh, you know, pretty straight ahead with me. And these Les Pauls, I have a couple explorers. And then, of course, for my guitar solo feature, uh, it's a Flying V now that's all geared up with the rockets. And uh, that guitar is very unique because uh, it shoots rockets and then a rapid fire uh, thing at the end of the guitar solo, which is pretty crazy. So the V is uh, uh, for the special guitar solo bit. Yeah. Uh, just announced today was the uh, Gibson, uh, the Gibson Learning app. Uh, you've done or well, broken down four solos for that. Yeah. Uh, Black Diamond, Detroit Rock City, Shout It Out Loud, and Psycho yeah. Circus. Was that uh, an enjoyable uh, experience? Yeah, you know, I'm, uh, Gibson asked me to be involved. They're doing this new ramping up with this new app and they have a few people they're featuring playing some of the solos from from the different uh the different bands and different artists and things like that so i picked four things uh and uh, it was a lot of fun to do that just sit down and, and show how to play it then you slow it down and, and do it again so people can kind of really see and then they have some some tablature and things that you know make sense for people <laughs> that are learning to play guitar and but it's a lot of fun and i i think uh I had a good time doing it and I think it turned out really well, actually. So I hope people have fun with that. Yeah. Um, I believe before a show, you do your own makeup, which takes a couple of hours. Uh, yeah. Is that time also important for your mental preparation for the show? It is. I mean, a lot of people don't realize it, but everyone in Kiss has always done their own makeup. So I do my own makeup every night. Uh, we all sit together in the dressing room, listen to music. We trade off on who gets the DJ each night and we play our stuff that's whatever we have on our iPhones and stuff. And, but it's, it's a good time to kind of get into the mode. It's a transition. It's the, uh, 
you know, evolving into the Kiss characters, really. And it's, uh, I can't imagine not doing that every night, um, getting ready and, and putting the makeup on it. Like you said, it takes an hour or two, and then we get into our outfits and get everything ready. So it's quite a, a, a preparation and it's a real transition from just being normal people into, into Kiss. Yeah, I was talking to Joe Satriani the other day, and he's been doing a lot of painting uh, and washing his hands. And it said that it messes with his calluses. Um, oh, really? Does the makeup and the washing the hands do that for you too? Not really. Uh, people ask, oh, does the makeup, you know, does that screw your skin up? And it actually, I think maybe it moisturizes your skin a little bit because I've never had a problem with it. Uh, you know, the thing that gets a little crazy is that the boots and the outfits, you know, we get so sweaty and night after night and we have multiple outfits so we can try uh, trade off night to night and give let certain ones dry a little bit more and that kind of thing but there's a lot of sweating and you know uh, you know you get kind of rashes and you know the boots are not completely comfortable sometimes and you know you get a lot of uh you know they kind of rough you up a little bit and and so that's the the part you have to kind of get used to and deal with on the road it's uh it's more just the outfits and 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 kind of the abuse that you take a little bit from from wearing that stuff night after night and trying to move around and just being so sweaty it gets a little crazy uh, so we have the chance to hit a golf course in australia well i'm i'm bringing my golf clubs you know doc mcgee and i get out and we play a lot of our favorite courses and we've played in australia before we played royal melbourne and uh some other great courses uh, you know throughout the country in perth we've played a few times and I'll have my sticks with me and uh, we have some extra days off in Australia because, because of the, you know, the, the, uh, the distance between cities, it takes the production, the trucks and stuff a little bit longer to get city to city. So the, the Australian tour is always a little more spread out time-wise. So it gives us a few more days off. And so we'll enjoy those and Doc and I'll enjoy it on the golf course, of course. Uh, have you ever got to play with Alice Cooper? Of course, Alice is a good friend of mine, and, and we've played golf many times. Uh, as a matter of fact, he does a, a big fundraiser for his foundation every year. It's called Solid Rock Foundation. They do after school music and dance programs for kids, and it's been really successful. And uh, so he's invited me to come out to his, his event every year, and we get to play music together. We play Alice Cooper songs and some Kiss songs, and but it's a lot of fun. And uh, But we play golf too, of course. And so I played golf with Alice and there's a lot of other musicians, you know, Alex Lifeson from Rush. We played golf. He's a, a great golfer. Um, Robbie Krieger is a great friend of mine. We play a lot of golf. Uh, Danny Serafin and some of the guys from Chicago. Uh, so it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of musicians like to get out and play golf, it seems. And a lot of golfers wish they could play guitar. So it's just a, it's a trade-off. Yeah. Uh, just one more and I'll, I'll let you go. Um, have you given much thought to life after Kiss? Will you continue to play? Uh -huh. Of course. I mean, I don't I don't know if I'll ever be in another band and that sort of thing, because how can you top being in Kiss? But I'll probably still be involved in music or in the entertainment biz on some level, maybe even with Kiss, because Kiss is not going to go away. You know, the, the touring thing is, but, you know, the entity of Kiss and the, the brand and, and everything, the music, there's, you know, that's not going to stop. So maybe there's uh, something for me to be involved with that. But, you know, I've been doing some other things. I've been involved in uh, developing some animation projects uh, children's animation projects and maybe some of that will see the the light of day um i've also been delving into the wine business a little bit now i bought some vineyard property up in oregon and uh, i've got some wines coming out through my brother's uh wine label pete's mountain vineyards.com you can check it out uh so there's a lot of things I'm, I'm i'm always pretty busy and quite involved in a lot of things but as far as bands and things like that playing in bands i, I think that this will be it for me as far as that goes yeah. Well, Tommy, it's, it's been great to chat. We look forward to seeing you very soon. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure. And we're looking forward to getting down there and seeing everybody soon down, uh, down in uh, the land down under.